Hello everybody. Welcome again to the Saroy, Saroy channel and good evening to you. I have a fantastic story today that you're absolutely going to love and it comes from Tessa in rural Tennessee and she has called it Bigfoot Stole My Baby or Bigfoot Stole the Baby, sorry, correction. She writes, Dear Sarah, I do want to stress that I really need to remain anonymous. And if that was not a promise on your part, I would most certainly not tell my story to either you or your listeners. I would also prefer to leave dates, places and names out of the equation for my own personal protection, if you do not mind. This is partly because as a young girl of 15 years old, all that time ago, Perhaps I did not behave as responsibly as I should have around the time that Bigfoot took the baby. My sister Peggy was 18 years old when she had a baby out of wedlock. She never told the father about the impending pregnancy. You, sh you see, she had had a fleeting one night stand with him and she did not want him to be involved in the raising of her child. Peggy was an amazing mother and there was nothing that she would not do for her little Kirsty. She even took up a job as a nurse working night shifts so that she could give the best possible standard of living to her growing sprog. Peggy and I grew up with my grandmother who took care of us and raised us from when we were knee high to a grasshopper. All we knew about my mother was that she had suffered from substance abuse, drug addiction and drug addiction and so the authorities had entrusted my grandmother to the legal guardianship of both of us. Rumours abounded around our town that my mother had become a down and out, or vagrant, so to speak. Our grand was an amazing woman, but she was hard of hearing and also suffered from really bad arthritis, which really meant she did struggle getting around, and so most of the household duties, including the babysitting, were left to me. I did not mind, of course, but being a young 15-year-old girl at the time, I did have my mind on other matters, so to speak. I was seeing a boy two years older than myself who lived in the town. He was very clever, always getting the highest grades at school to boot. To school. He was always getting the highest grades at school. To boot, he was also extremely handsome, and most of my friends were very jealous of my amazing relationship with him. In those days, we were pretty much inseparable. My boyfriend Jason was also a keen hunter of moose, and even though he had not been shooting for long, he did have a reputation of being an amazing shot. Men twice his age were amazed by how brilliant a hunter he really was. I loved living in Tennessee countryside. It was a beautiful life as far as I was concerned, and I really loved the great outdoors. Jason loved helping my grandmother, and he did all kinds of odd jobs around the house and chopped firewood for those long, drawn-out cold nights we get in this part of the world. The woods that surrounded our home were magical because they were abundant with wildlife and animals of every kind. Jason and I would take long walks in the forest, sometimes accompanied by our two bulldogs, Jessie and Bella. One day, Jason suggested that we go for a picnic in the woods and as I was on babysitting duty, he suggested that we could take Kirsty with us in a pram, as well as our two bulldogs. It seemed like a great idea, but I insisted on finishing the washing up first for my grandmother, and then I packed us an amazing picnic lunch. I filled up the Tupperware lunch tin, tin with ham and tomato sandwiches, beef jerky and chocolate nut brownies. And let's not forget the Coca-Cola. For Jason, no meal was the same without that fizzy sweet soda. Then off we went into the woods to have a spectacular picnic lunch. It was a magnificent sunny day. And as we approached the woods, we were surprised to find that all was unusually quiet and still. There were no animals darting past us like they usually would, like the odd deer or even rabbit. Everything was extremely silent and rather uncomfortable to say the least. Worse still, both of my build bulldogs did not want to venture into the woods at all and literally had to be dragged in 
and persuaded in by Jason, if you know what if you know what bulldogs are like at all, they are stubborn creatures and it is very difficult to persuade them to do something if they're dead set against it. I had never seen my dogs behave like this on a walk. They nearly always loved their trips to the woods, but today was different and I could hear that both of my beloved pets were far from happy. They had never behaved like this before, I explained to Jason. Not to worry, laughed Jason. Dogs have a good sense of smell. They might have smelt something they didn't like. Like what, I asked. Dunno, said Jason. Anything, I suppose. Dogs can be sensitive, you know. Kirsty was such a beautiful baby who never cried like some babies do. She normally gurgled with laughter and was always smiling. But on this occasion, she started to cry and cry and cry. I took her out of the pram to comfort her and I started her bobbing up her up and down as I held her in my arms. That seemed to do the trick. Before long, she stopped crying and we continued on our way into the woods. We finally found a perfect spot for our picnic where there was a rocky verge with a, a small little stream running on the side. The large expanse of smooth rocks was so lovely and warm and so enticing that Jason and I decided to sunbathe on them. It was not long before we both fell into a deep sleep. I awoke to find both of my bull bulldogs growling fiercely with their ears down and their tails between their legs. They both looked fearful. I looked up and woke jo Jason up, shaking him violently. The dogs really are being weird, I urged him. Something doesn't feel right. I think we need to leave. The dogs are sensing something. Jason was feeling it too, and so hastily we retreated out of the forest. And it was only as we were leaving that I noticed that little Kirsty was not in her pram anymore. She had gone. I cried out in horror. Where is Kirsten? Where is Kirsten? She's not here. She's not here. We left her in the pram when we were sleeping, didn't we? Jason nodded. We did. Well, where is she then? Jason, she's gone. What am I going to do? Peggy is going to kill me, I cried. Calm down, urged Jason. There has to be some rational explanation for this, because a baby just does not disappear like this. Let's go back and see if she's by the picnic spot. Maybe you put her down on the ground and not back in the pram. Who knows? Supposing... Supposing something dreadful has happened to her, I cried. I did not know what was going through my head. All I knew is that my focus was to get back my beautiful niece now as soon as we could. We rushed to our picnic spot as quickly as we could, but there was no sign of Kirsty anywhere. She was well and truly gone, and I was devastated. I was afraid and overwhelmed all rolled into one. What are we going to do, I cried. It's all my fault. I should not have gone to sleep like that. How could I do that? Something took her while we were asleep. I know, I said. Or someone, corrected Jason. Maybe a child napper followed us to, into the forest. Or maybe a wild animal took the baby, I suggested. We considered all the possibilities. And then we heard it, the sound of a baby crying, and it wasn't too far off. It's Kirsty, I cried out in relief. She's somewhere here. I know it. Can you hear her? We tied the bulldogs to a tree, left the empty pram at the clearing, and then we tiptoed towards the area that we could hear the crying from. The crying got louder and louder, and we realised that we were getting closer and closer to where Kirsty was. We hid behind the huge trunk of a red cedar tree and peeked, ar peeked around the corner to see who the kidnapper was who had taken our little Kirsty. And there she was. I knew she was a she because she had placed little Kirsty on the nipple of one of her full dangling breasts. At first the baby seemed resistant to this alien kind of flesh. flesh. You see, she had been raised on formula and so was not used to a mother's breast milk. 
let alone a creature like this. After a while, she stopped crying as she drank the milk from this huge creature's breast, gurgling with delight. If this creature was nursing, I thought, where is her real baby? And then it occurred to me, maybe her real baby had died. But what on earth, I thought, what on earth is this creature? This creature was enormous, yet she was underweight for someone, for something as large as she was. She was not standing, but squatting on the floor with Kirsty in her arms, and she was chattering to the baby as if trying to soothe it. Kirsty gurgled with delight. She was enjoying the attention of this terrifying looking beast. I was sick to my stomach and my insides were cheer churning with sheer horror of the situation. The creature was covered with dark auburn hair and the face was cone shaped and the body proportions were mammoth in size. The arms rarely drew my attention because they were exceptionally long, but I will say this for her. She appeared to be extremely gentle with Kirsty. As I had grown to suspect, she was a mother who had lost her baby, and I did feel a smouldering sense of sympathy for her. Yet this creature should never have taken poor little Kirsty. It was not right, I thought angrily. Even though I was filled with terror and horror, as well as all, 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 at, all at the same time, with what I was witnessing, I just knew we had to get the baby away from this creature. But how? I beckoned to Jason and he followed me away from the tree to an area where I felt I could talk to him without being overheard by the creature. Luckily our stealth had paid off and she had not noticed us creeping away from her. But that may have been because she was so wrapped up in her mothering instinct looking after baby Kirsty. She's clearly not going to hurt Kirsty, I said. You can see she's smitten by her. We just have to get Kirsty away from her. What shall we do? Did you see how emaciated she is, I asked. Her bones were sticking out of her flesh like a starving dog. Maybe we should put our picnic lunch near enough to her so that it lures her to the food. I suspect she's starving for some reason, although I don't know why. There's so much wildlife out here. Maybe she's sad about her baby's death. And maybe she lost weight as a result. I considered that thought. That was a plausible explanation, I thought. We need to kill her, said Jason, picking up his large rifle. I'm a good shot, he said. I'll take her out in a second. She will not feel a thing, I promise. I was horrified by Jason's suggestion. I do not mind warning shots, I said. If they're needed, of course, and only if they're needed. But did you not see her? The poor thing was so desperate to be a mother. You could see that a mile off. I do not want to kill her unless you have to. Promise me that you will not hurt her unless things start to get dangerous for us. I still think we should take her out, he insisted. This is a dangerous creature that we are dealing with. You realise this thing could kill us in an instant if it wanted to. Look, I said, let's just try this food thing. You never know, it may just work. A uh, Jason was very reluctant, but I opened up the Tupperware containers and told him to go and get the pram and the dogs while I prepared the food trap. I put the Coca-Cola and all the delicious food that we had brought as close as I could to where the creature was sitting and nursing Kirsty. I then hid behind the tree and watched her. She sniffed the air curiously, and I think she could smell the food. She suddenly put down Kirsty, got on all fours, and literally ran to where the food was. I could hear her making sounds that you hear when a ravenous animal is suddenly tuck tucking into a meal. I rushed over to the area where she had put Kirsty down, and I beckoned to Jason, who was now with the dogs, and we just ran out of that forest as fast as we could without looking behind us. A while later, in the distance, we could hear the howls of a creature, clearly in great distress. The poor thing sounded so desperate, like a mother grieving the loss of a dead baby, and now the loss of Kirsty, 
who was never hers in the first place. As you can imagine, I never ever told my sister about what had happened with her baby. I knew if I had, she would never have trusted me with her child again. Frankly, I would not have blamed her. But would she have believed my story anyway? Somehow I doubted it. You and your listeners may think that I never ventured near those woods again, but that is where you're wrong. I felt so very sorry for the creature that I persuaded jo Jason to let me go into the woods and leave parcels of food from her, for her from time to time. He thought it was a terrible idea, but only agreed to it because he did not want me to go into the woods on my own behind his back without any am ammunition in tow. We did leave parcels for the creature on a regular basis, and a few years went by, and one day when we both went into the forest, we saw the creature again, although luckily she did not see us. I'm almost certain it was her, and this time she had gained weight and looked as if she weighed 700 pounds. She looked magnificent, and the best thing of all was that she was carrying a baby Sasquatch in her arms. I went home feeling so very happy, and over the years I continued to leave her food until we both moved away from Tennessee. I do think of that Sasquatch often because I now know that what I saw was indeed a Bigfoot, and I wonder if she is still alive today or where her little sprog is. I really related to her somehow, even though she was so dangerous. I hope you and your viewers enjoyed my story. What a fantastic story. I enjoyed that story so much, and I hope everybody else listening did, did too. Good night, until next time.